going to start by um, speaking about psychodynamic therapies in general. Um, and I think it's always a good idea to put things in some sort of context. Um, it would be fair to say, I, I, in my opinion at least, that um, historically that uh, talking and relationship, communication in a, uh, a relationship of trust and care has been a central aspect of emotional healing in all cultures and all traditions. Uh, it's been formalized and systematized into approaches to psychotherapy probably in the, roughly the last 130 years or so. But um, I think it's important to bear in mind that there's a longer history than that and one that we shouldn't ignore, particularly when we're considering people's needs, which I think is what this meeting is about. Um, However, I think the, really the uh, original form of psychotherapy in the modern era is psychoanalysis. I think it's also important to acknowledge that because uh, people uh, have made all sorts of critiques of psychoanalysis, but it was a very important cr uh, contribution, I think, one that uh, really puts in place the idea of working with individual minds working at a mental level, you might say, and developing a systematic understanding based on that kind of first-hand experience with people. Uh, I think Freud, again, the, the notion of lying on the couch for a long period gets parodied, and I'll put up a cartoon about that, but um, nevertheless, it involves careful listening, active listening to the patient over a long period the development of a relationship of really knowing someone in some depth. And I think that remains an important contribution to the field. Uh, it's introduced an understanding of mental development, not just physical development. And again, I think that's a perspective that we need to retain. So there's an awful lot, including the, the broad idea of the unconscious, which I think has been really validated in many ways by modern neuroscience, uh, there are very important from perspectives from psychoanalysis that we should continue to be informed by. And I think it's relevant to the treatment of all people, not just borderline personality disorder, but it remains an important treatment and really the progenitor of other psychotherapeutic approaches, I would say. So, uh, um, I see they had a bit of a caricature here and um, perhaps this isn't a borderline patient because <laughs> most patients with BPD would have more eventful lives I think and they'd be aware of their lives being stormy and eventful. Uh, you know one of the critiques of psychoanalysis broadly speaking is that it takes too long um, and you know I think there's been a tendency in psychoanalytic treatments uh, treatments, or there was for a long time, for the length of treatment to increase. I think that's really being reviewed by a lot of people working in psychodynamic therapies at the moment. And I think there's a much greater interest in shorter forms of engagement as well. Um, and perhaps that's been a necessary development. Uh, just to comment briefly on what I think are some important developments. Uh, you know, you said many of you will have heard of the School of Object Relations. Uh, that's very important, I think, in changing the ground in psychodynamic understanding towards a primacy of the importance of relationship and how that's important and what is meaningful to people from the beginning of life. <coughs> Winnicott, I think, is a particularly important figure uh, uh, in emphasizing the role of the environment in people's development. So whereas Freud and Klein had emphasized drive, there's a shift to understanding that interaction with the environment is very much formative in development. Um, Cohut is uh, known for the development of the School of Self-Psychology. Uh, while I won't go into detail, I think broadly speaking, he shifted from uh, a, an authoritative position of 
interpreting in a classical way to one of staying with what the patient was giving him and responding empathically. This is certainly a development that we think is important in the conversational model as well and has been uh, influential uh, across the field, I would say, particularly relevant to working with BPD as well. Um, uh, the developments like the developments that you'll all be familiar with in attachment uh, theory and understanding of the importance of attachments, the, the ways attachments can go wrong, uh, the subtleties, I think, of attachment. Uh, Bowlby's a, a central figure in that, but there have been many others. I'm only giving you a brief overview. I think, importantly, in the last 20 to 30 years, uh, a development of the understanding of the importance of trauma is central. Um, you know, it, it, I think we still struggle with that professionally, to be honest. Uh, you know, there are many of my colleagues that don't really sit comfortably with the idea of trauma as a major causative factor in mental disturbance of various kinds, including there's a strong association with BPD. But there is a shift towards accepting that. That shift is perhaps exemplified by the fact that uh, this year, with the uh, finalization of ICD-11, the diagnostic category of complex traumatic stress disorder will be recognized officially. It's a very important development, in my view. Uh, and various people, I've only mentioned a couple, uh, have contributed to the move away from the drive-based model, which really leaves the patient feeling responsible for everything because it's all put down to internal drives, to this trauma-based recognizing of the importance of the environment kind of model. Again, that's a big shift and I think one that actually allows more people to access treatment with dignity. Um, amongst the other figures that are mentioned, uh, I should highlight Russell Mears. He's important for the conversational model. Some of you will have heard of him. But he's, he's Australian as well. And uh, I think um, it's perhaps important to recognize that the development of some approaches to psychotherapy have occurred here in Australia. Uh, and he's been influential worldwide. He's been recognized internationally for his work. Um, so. When I started uh, working in mental health in the late 1980s, uh, the inherited wisdom was pretty much that um, you know, personality disorder was pretty difficult to treat at all, um, and that uh, particularly many of these patients would be too behaviorally disturbed, too much inclined to acting out to be contained in a tr traditional psychoanalytic framework. Now, that's, that's true up to a point, I think, at least for the more severe um, people in that spectrum. But, um, uh, you know, there has been a lot of alternate approaches that have developed in recent times. Uh, and uh, psychoanalytic psychotherapy, which is less intense than a classical psychoanalysis, is considered by many to be the treatment of choice. There's also been a great increase in optimism about treatment, I think, and uh, again, our, our own group in, uh, in Australia is, has been partly responsible, so I've highlighted two landmark studies, uh, Linehan's in, published in 91, and uh, Stevenson and Mears, an Australian study uh, that was using therapy that has now come to be called the conversational model published in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 92. These were very important studies, I think, in uh, demonstrating, <coughs> providing evidence that treatment for this group of patients was possible and that real benefits accrued. So again, important to mention the Australian connection, I think. Um, since then, of course, there have been many studies that um, attest to the treatability of borderline personality disorder, and I think we should speak more broadly about personality disorder in general as well. Now, the conversational model in particular developed out of a collaboration between Robert Hobson, who was a Jungian analyst originally, and Russell Mears, 
uh, it developed, uh, their, their professional relationship developed in the UK, but Russell uh, moved here as the foundation uh, professor of psychiatry at Westmead uh, in the, uh, around 1980, uh, the foundation uh, professor. Um, and so the, the program was established in the 1980s and the program of which I'm now director uh, has been going now for over 30 years. Uh, treated you know, many hundreds of patients by now and uh, we continue to uh, demonstrate effectiveness. Indeed, uh, we have rather expanded our, uh, uh, our treatment group uh, beyond borderline personality disorder uh, covering what we consider to be complex traumatic conditions which can include uh, presentations such as recurrent or treatment resistant depression for instance, anxiety disorders, uh, somatization disorders and a range of things. Um, now, the conversational model uh, is one that seeks to uh, understand the person from their perspective. Uh, I think if one enters into a conversation where you're prepared to listen and respond, then, uh, you know, little by little change occurs. The actual communications that happen between people are very important, I think, in relation to the final outcome. Uh, you know, I was speaking to Shay a, a little earlier and he was saying often he gets the response in a health system where they say, well, talking is someone else's business. Uh, but talking is, is a, an age-old method of healing and it shouldn't be downgraded, <laughs> which it sometimes is. The conversational model um, is a psychology of self, so we attempt to respond to the whole person, uh, not to analyse in terms of uh, uh, you know, things like e ego and superego, so we try to think in terms of the whole person response, and we prioritise feeling. All mental states, all of our conscious experience has a feeling component. That's what, on the one hand, people feel to be most personal, it's also a universal, so we share uh, emotions. It's a way we have of resonating with each other. It's very important in communication. Emotional intelligence shouldn't be seen as a lesser form of communication than a cognitive communication. And again, sometimes that happens. Now there's a, a twin focus in, in the conversational model, one on the growth of self, so we try to build on people's strengths and see what their interests are, see what their potentials are, even when they're having difficulty seeing that <coughs> themselves. Um, we think that if you just have an exclusive focus on trauma, A, it can be very confronting and difficult for people to engage. They don't, not everyone feels safe with that straight away. Uh, and. Um, B, I think you're leaving out what is most valuable in the person. That needs to be recognised. Um, so look, just a brief comment on some of the many treatments that have developed. Uh, you'll hear more about DBT shortly, but um, to my mind, you know, there's an emphasis, emphasis on the affect regulation, a behavioural control and reflective functioning. It does tend to prioritise rational mind over emotional mind, to my uh, observation. MBT is an important treatment, um, starting to become available in Australia as well. Um, again, promotes the idea of reflective function and uh, a way of being reflective about one's mental states. It, it emerged, interestingly, out of work at the Anna Freud Centre, psychoanalytic work originally, uh, and both Bateman Fonagy and Mer Mary Tarje, leaders in that field, are all psychoanalysts. Um, but they have moved towards a different way of working, uh, a shorter, shorter, involving shorter forms of engagement and more focused, targeted forms of engagement. One of the important findings in their work at the Anna Freud Center was that um, they were able to distinguish developmentally that uh, some people had real deficits that had prevented the formation of certain capacities 
uh, what you might call ego strengths, and that you needed to work for longer and more intensively with that group of people than with what they contrasted with a, a higher functioning, what they called neurotic group of uh, young children. So I think that's quite an important background, I think, because uh, traditionally psychotherapies were seen as more applicable to the neurotic group, whereas I think there's a shift in some ways to reverse that trend. Uh, you know, a conversational model is a transference-based approach. Any transference-based approach involves uh, using and reflecting on the immediate experience in the therapeutic relationship, not seeing that as uh, something that's out of bounds, so to speak. And that would come into play from the beginning in all those approaches. Uh, and there have been a number of other approaches apart from our own which have demonstrated efficacy. And stepped care, I think, is an important idea, and I'll be interested to hear the discussion about that. But um, uh, the idea that everyone sort of needs to go and have 10 years analysis, I think, is outmoded for most people. Um, and I think increasingly we need to think of episodes of care, of patients having choices about what they do, what they're willing to commit to at any given time. Uh, and that the, the system should respond to that. So, uh, you know, often if, if you can get good access to care initially, even if it's a short intervention, it provides a start. And, you know, you have, if you're a patient, you have someone else on your team and you can plan the next step as well. So I think it's increasingly come into fashion. One of the studies I quote here, McMahon's study, contrasted uh, DBT with uh, general psychiatric management as practiced by John Gunderson and his team, a very important figure in borderline uh, personality disorder research. That kind of general uh, psychiatric management, I think, um, uh, did involve episodes of care. It was psychodynamically informed, but it was not a psychoanalysis. It was not a classical approach to that treatment. And sometimes the, the episodes of care were in, in the realm of uh, a couple of months rather than longer periods, and it was still shown to be efficacious. So I think I'm getting some looks from Jonathan, which might mean I'm going over time. Um, I'll wind up a couple of comments on Brianne. Look, I'd just like to listen to her story, get her point of view, uh, look towards finding some common ground about what was important to her, how she understood her problems. There's enough information provided that you could make a diagnosis, but I think for me, it would be important to hear her views before I rush to diagnosis. Um, uh, I, I guess the rest of these points might come up in discussion, so in the uh, interests of time, I'll wind up. I'll leave you with this question. Um, now, the public sector doesn't always see its role as providing psychotherapy and where it does see its role it's generally short intervention. So I've described a range of interventions I think. I put the question to you should public sector psychiatry uh, make a commitment to providing longer interventions? I think it's an important question for all of us. Thank you.